Hi, everybody. This is Sanjay Swami here, and welcome to another episode of the Prime Venture Partners podcast. Uh, I have with me uh, an old friend and a special guest here, Birud Shet. Birud is the founder of Gupshap, uh, and Gupshap was recently in the news. Uh, company turned unicorn. Com- congratulations, Birud. Um, and, um, you know, but uh, Gupshap took a very special uh, journey along the way, and, and we do keep reading about unicorns these days a lot. But uh, the journey of Gupshap is definitely a very uh, unique one and uh, really traverses, you know, several generations of uh, uh, the early days of the internet in India and, and uh, to what it has evolved to today. So, Birud, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sanjay. Thanks for having me here. Really excited. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, so maybe we can start a little bit with your background, Birud, as well as a quick overview of the journey of uh, Gupshap. Sure. Yeah, I've been, uh, I mean, I grew up in Mumbai, uh, IIT Bombay, uh, computer science, and then I came to the US for grad school uh, at MIT. Uh, This was in the early 90s. And then uh, I had a short stint on Wall Street uh, for about four or five years. Uh, And then I co-founded Elance with a couple of my college friends, uh, IIT friends. Um, Elance pioneered the gig economy, online freelancing. There was a long journey as well, but, you know, about three years ago, Elance uh, became Upwork and did an IPO on NASDAQ. It's a $6 billion company now. Uh, So that was one long journey. Now, I wasn't there at the company all throughout, right? I was there in an operating role for about eight or nine years, still on the board for another eight years. And then, you know, I'm now a shareholder still. Uh, But when I left my operating role, I founded co-founded Gupshop again with more IT friends. And um, yeah, that's been a, you touched on it, like been a 15, uh, 14, 15 year journey. And unlike uh, the spate of unicorns, ours is different. You know, it's it's been 15 years, not three or four years like some of the others. Uh, we are profitable, not like some of the others, you know, and uh, also growing and scaling very nicely. So happy to share more, share my experiences along the way. Wonderful. Maybe we'll dive into that. I mean, I was just thinking when I was, um, uh, you know, a trip from Bangalore to San Francisco used to take 30 hours, probably when you started Gupshap. And now is a nonstop 16 hour flight. So a lot has happened in various <laughs> uh, industries, right? And certainly, uh, maybe you can start a little by telling us about the business of Gupshap uh, and the early days. And, and of course, it probably is three phases, if I think about it, from the, the SMS era to the mobile internet era and now to the API world and perhaps the, the WhatsApp era. So yeah. it would be great to hear, you know, your, uh, uh, your views on, you know, on the journey itself and, you know, what were some of these inflection points and how you adapted the business to it. Sure. So Gupshap is a conversational messaging platform, right? And these are big words. So, or, so let me explain. Um, firstly, uh, messaging is straightforward, right? You today, most of your listeners, they receive text messages on their mobile device. Uh, your bank tells you that you spent hundred rupees uh, at the cafe, you know, or your payment is due uh, tomorrow. Your e-commerce company says your order is confirmed, your package is shipped, you know, your food is arriving, your flight is booked, hotel is booked, and so on, right? All of these are text messages, notifications that customers receive and we are the platform that that powers it right we are a messaging platform in that sense and now you know what today is just simple basic one way notifications plain text only uh you know that era is evolving into uh you know a, a rich sort of rich messages with two way conversational experiences and so on where you can actually have a meaningful chat with the business so, for example, when you get that payment reminder with a couple of clicks, you can actually make the payment. When you get a, a package delivery notification with a couple of clicks, you can, you know, reschedule the package delivery, or you can upgrade that flight, or uh, get more details about your credit card, and on and on. Right. So we think that as we evolve from this world of notification-based, one-way notification-based messaging to a rich two-way conversation-based messaging it opens up a whole new set of use cases around uh, you know customer support around e-commerce around marketing 
and, and so on. So very excited about that. We are the infrastructure and the platform that powers all of it. We handle, you know, it's very high scale, about five, six billion messages a month uh, and very substantial revenues as well, right? Um, you asked about the history. Now, it's not, you know, this is where we are right now, but obviously, you know, this is not how you start. The entrepreneurial journey is, as you know, very meandering and we've had our own fair share of uh, successes and failures. So uh, just to go back a little bit, right? I think uh, when we started, we, you know, what's been constant throughout is we saw the power of messaging in particular SMS as a way to reach billions of users, right? Even when you had feature phones, really the only way to reach people, right? Was, was SMS much more than the web or email, uh, you know, SMS was truly ubiquitous. And we in fact, initially launched a, um, a, a social network really based on SMS. Now, you know, if it sounds familiar, it was exactly the same idea as Twitter at the same time, um, except that Twitter started in the, in the US and eventually became a web product, right? Inspired by SMS while we remained in India and remained an SMS product. Now, believe it or not, our product grew a lot faster. We had like 70 million users in India uh, at a time where Twitter or Facebook had less than a million users in India at that time, right? In like 2010 or something. Uh, so it was enormously successful, uh, okay? But uh, we were subsidizing the cost of all those messages, right? And um, we thought that, you know, with volumes, the unit prices would, would decline, but they didn't. And also the regulator said you couldn't put footer ads in it. So we could neither subsidize nor monetize, right? And when you hit sort of a, think of it, it's a, it's sort of bittersweet, right? On the one hand, it's an enormous success. On the other hand, it's sort of a, a real failure point, right? And what we did, and you know, I think usually that's the way I think, which is, okay, what's working and why? And what, what can we retain? And what's not working and why? And how do we change it, right? And we said, okay, the platform is great handle scale, very engaging, uh, but we can't afford it. So can we find somebody else who can pay for it, right? And we sort of flipped it around or modified it to an enterprise model where, you know, big banks and uh, that e-commerce companies were just growing, but but big banks and airlines and so on could, could pay to send these messages. So anyway, we sort of evolved to the enterprise model and then grew from there. And now, of course, you know, we've layered on the whole conversational experience as well. So just sort of, some idea of the overall journey right so so Biro, you know i mean uh, obviously since it's been a, a, a very um, i would say um, you know a, a journey that very few startups will actually realize right because most uh, entrepreneurs and i remember being an entrepreneur around the same time as you started uh, with mcheck and then later uh, you know zip dial where we worked together uh, as well um, but most companies, you know, um, I would say either the ones that do last tend to end up having sort of a uh, fairly uh, sequential progression uh, you know, and, and an evolution. But in your case, the world completely changed also from when it started to the introduction of smartphones, uh, then the, the mobile internet coming, uh, you know, in a very big way, and I'm sure... When you started, there were these operator-led wall gardens and premium SMS and all these uh, things, but a lot of that sort of evolved quite a bit, right? So clearly, some of this you may have an, had an opinion that they might arrive, but you know, clearly nobody knew when and how they were going to take off, and certainly uh, in emerging markets versus the Western world. So how do you? And, and and this is happening probably a little faster these days, you know, the 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 various evolutions. But how do entrepreneurs? Uh, look at these moments and say, you know, this is an opportunity where something fundamental is changing. You know, the the rug is being pulled from under us, and we have to to switch gears. And you know, and perhaps uh, pivot is probably sometimes uh, a misunderstood word, but adapt to the the changing world. Uh, right. And you've done that while still remaining in the core area of conversational uh, messaging for corporates, for the most part. So. Uh, how, how how should entrepreneurs look at such moments? I would say in payments in India, if you think about uh, from, you know, cards to uh, wallets and now to UPI, again, there have been these moments where, you know, the business has completely changed, right? So uh, what thoughts would you give for to entrepreneurs to look out for these moments and to grab them? Um, 
you know that, that's a great uh, question and i think every uh, every disruption or maybe even a paradigm shift right really is both it's clearly both in a, a threat and an opportunity right it's it's a threat to incumbent players it's an opportunity for newer players um, and it really uh, entrepreneurs have to navigate that and not just here but you, you know you look at companies long standing company like apple and microsoft and even google have had to navigate you know the desktop era to the web era to the mobile era and cloud and so on right uh, so i think the only thing in, in our industry the only thing constant is change right so you, you the the way to adjust i, I think at least the the thing that's worked for me really is you know uh, you need to be uh, one at a minimum aware of it but that's not enough right because because i think looking peering into the future is is a little overrated i mean you know i think it's yes you can anticipate but these are systemic changes these are large complex systems with multiple players um, and it's really hard to predict everything right so you kind of the way i like to think of it is you have to uh, hedge you have to tinker you have to experiment uh you you have to devote a certain amount you know if you're an established company you have to devote a certain amount of your resources and teams just on you know futuristic experimental stuff um or if you're an entrepreneur i mean you devote some of your time uh, to that thing and say just play with it and see what the new user experience will be what are the fundamental assumptions that are going to be uh, changed and modified and who is going to impact and how and i think at gupshop what we've done is we are just constantly i mean you know uh, i i put out a founders note uh, uh, coinciding with the funding thing where i actually have enumerated about you know i don't know eight or 10 innovations that we've done over the last few years uh, i would say most of them have in one way failed right by which i mean like some of those ideas were ahead of their time some of those products are were anticipated ecosystem changes that never happened but every one of those innovations right certainly moved us forward because we learned something we learned about how it could be we learned about why it didn't work and what's yet to happen but but the great thing is uh, you know the the one or two things that did work were really just breakout successes and you know in a way what happens is you've kind of seen the movie right we've we've seen it i've seen it in sort of earlier versions now it didn't become a commercial success but it was certainly a product success and most importantly it was an educational success in 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 my mm. mind right mm. i think really uh you know you're dealing with uh, yeah just how do you think about it and you know maybe the analogy is a financial portfolio theory sort of model where you just put some of your resources as a portfolio hedge where if something changes and it grows up it you know it works that way and inherently you know it it may not succeed but you you just expect that uh, ab testing trial and error and and so on right i think um, I mean, that's the only sort of generic principle now of course if you get specific into certain spaces you know you can uh, you can get more detailed or or specific suggestions as well but but generally sure. this is the rule that i found yeah got it and and related to you know a uh, long uh, 15 year period here um is obviously you know the the ability to sustain yourself uh you know and in the beginning you know uh, i i noticed your your fundraising was probably about uh, 40 odd million dollars in the first you know six years of the journey of the company and then a, a long gap till you know two weeks ago at least when it was announced of of the large you know 100 million dollar round right so uh you know when did you um so you know obviously companies uh, struggle with the balance of investing for growth investing in innovation versus you know getting profitable and staying that way uh and then perhaps uh being around by being profitable and seeing an inflection point and then jumping on it which seems to be uh, the journey here um again you know from an advice for entrepreneurs perspective right um what what is the the mantra that you think uh, is the big take away from your journey here uh, in terms of balancing uh, you know growth versus uh, uh, building for profitability and sustenance uh, over a longer period of time yeah i think that's a uh, yeah that's an interesting uh, sort of challenge right i think in our case uh, there were phases where when we wanted to raise money people wouldn't give it and we just you know uh, 
we said we'll control our own destiny, you know, figure out a profitable model. And, and in our case, we were able to do it to then sustain. And, you know, today we are quite, you know, quite profitable, even as we are sort of high growth and so on. Right. So I think, uh, I don't know if a generic mantra of growth versus profits uh, really works. I think you really have to look at the space and how it's evolving, right? And in our case, uh, you know, it, as an entrepreneur, if you have the kind of space where investors are willing to fund growth uh, over a 10 year horizon to, and you know, then you have to play the long game because anybody who's playing the short game for profitability is going to lose, right? It, it just automatically because because as you know, uh, growth drives scale, which then drives profit. So there are some of these business models which only become profitable at scale. They're not profitable at low scale, right? And now on day one, the first time this happened, people didn't know that. They, they, they didn't know that with Amazon, right? It's only that now that we've seen the movie play out with Amazon and with numerous other e-commerce companies around the world, that, that investors are willing to take these long bets because they have the comfort factor saying it works, right? Uh, there are other kinds of spaces where if that's not resolved, then you may not, uh, you know, uh, well, first you have to articulate the vision saying, look, here's the reason why this becomes profitable longer stage. But for whatever reason, if it's not possible, then really there's no choice. The logical thing to do is to optimize for profitability. Otherwise, you don't, you're not going to survive very long. Survival. Yeah. And you don't have the growth capital. So it really, firstly, it depends on on context. And I think Oftentimes, many entrepreneurs don't think about the financial dimension of it, right? But we, we, we don't live, sit in an ivory tower or inside a bubble saying, okay, I'm going to build the best product alone. You know, we, there's a financial dimension to it, a you know, funding element to it, and then, of course, the product and innovation, right? So I think um, for us, I mean, we've, you know, we've always been aware of what the situation is on the funding side, on the banking side, as well as, of course, on the product and the consumer side. And, and frankly, I would even say this, right? The evolution of the space is such that like five years ago, I mean, I would admit that we were probably not, uh, or the space itself wasn't a very good investable space because it was growing moderately. There was limited room for innovation. It was uh, somewhat commoditized and, and so on. And by the way, we were aware of it, which is exactly the reason why we were constantly trying to innovate and find um, newer ways of, you know, creating new products that would therefore be either differentiated and higher margins and higher, you know, uh, sort of more viable. It's only now, right, over the over the last couple of years that IP-based messaging channels have emerged. For example, so previously it was all SMS, right, mm -hmm. where you're limited by the technology to 160 characters of plain text. But with IP, now you have WhatsApp, they opened up enterprise APIs for businesses to send messages. Okay, then Gupshup itself has pioneered something new uh, called uh, GIP, which is just short for Gupshup IP messaging channel. Uh, and then there are other things, you know, uh, that we are doing. And I won't go into all the details, but the point is, with these new channels, now you can have richer interactions, which allow and you two-way conversations, which really sort of dramatically expand the the addressable market. It expands international expansion because uh, opportunities because it's easier to do that, right? So, um, so because of that, uh, and then one other sort of uh, you know interesting thing was just the well, uh, a hugely impactful thing was the pandemic, right? And obviously, the pandemic is a very very difficult situation for lots of people and so on, but it's forced massive behavior change as far as technology is concerned. It's forced businesses to adapt to find new things like even your corner grocery store and the restaurant, right? They have to take orders through WhatsApp or through some messaging tools, right? So, so between um, sort of the, you know, the pandemic and maybe the growth of the digital economy proved to be beneficial tailwinds uh, in a way. Uh, and then the new technology innovation enables new use cases that allows you to do more, right? So, so this inflection point only happened. Now we've been waiting for it for like four or five years, but until the ecosystem and the tech, the broader tech ecosystem is ready and all the factors stars line up, you know, um, you just have to be patient. And I think this is the, the hardest thing about being an entrepreneur is just these, these moments where you really have to be patient, where, you know, you can't, sometimes you can't accelerate a market. You just have to wait for the market to come to you, right? It's a, it's a little bit like a surfer, right? Who's an expert surfer, but they can't show off their skills until the right wave 
comes along and, and you just have to wait for it. It's not, you know, you can't accelerate it, maybe a little bit, but, but when it comes, you know, you're prepared with your hard work, your preparation, your patience, and then you're ready to, to ride it. And I think, you know, so, so as an entrepreneur, you just really need to be aware of and realistic about what's going on. Like, you know, you know it may not be attractive, but it has massive potential. We never lost faith, even as we were realistic about its current prospects. Right. And, and, you know, a lot of this from your zip dial experience and so on and so forth. Right. I think the kind of things that we had to do in the early eras of the mobile tech ecosystem versus new. Right. So, so we were attempting for it and waiting for the right thing. But when it came, right, it's, as they say, success is when preparation meets opportunity. Right. We were prepared. We were not like, oh, disappointed or depressed. We were prepared and ready. And now, you know, it's sort of all come together. That's an amazing uh, key point there. Uh... Bureau, which is, you know, it's not just that companies have to be high, high growth or companies that aren't high growth are, uh, um, you know, uh, their time will come. It's that you had seen the future and you were probably a little ahead of where things were, but you knew that this was going to happen. It was a matter of time. It was not a question of if, right? And right. It, it happened when it happened and a few other things had to line up for it to happen. Uh, but uh, you were already very, very well prepared for it. And I guess because the company was profitable, you had the staying power to to also wait it out till uh, till, exactly. till the moment happened, right? So, right. Uh, yeah. I mean, just to qualify a little bit, right? You're right. Sometimes, you know, entrepreneurs may actually have hit a dead end, right? So you can't say, oh, I'm just going to wait another two years or five years and hopefully something will change. I mean, that's not how it works. I think it's important to recognize when you're at a dead end. And then do you have conviction or faith that either something in the ecosystem will change or that something you are going to change that will that will drive it out, right? So so I'm not, you know, I, it's it's careful to distinguish. So sometimes you say just cut it and move on and find another opportunity. Sometimes it makes sense to wait because there is, you know, something that will that is inevitable will will change. And, and that's where it makes sense to persevere. Right, right. So during those uh, moments, uh, Biro, just to dive in a little further, what gives you the confidence that uh, it's worth waiting it out, right? Is it the fact that you're uh, even in the, uh, is, is it because you think that, well, there's a technology transformation, or there's a step function growth that will eventually come. And until then we are, uh, we're capable of surviving or we are still even even in the existing system we are anyways the leader and so this is our opportunity that's going to come uh, so because you see several times there are companies that uh, I, I think this is the biggest challenge for entrepreneurs right for some you have this early rocket ship and, and there's nothing you can do to stop it right it's it's uh, you just keep adding more fuel to the fire and as you said at some point you do hope that you can make all the economics and the model work, but it's like uh, it's like a spacecraft that's taking off, right? It's shuddering like crazy, but it's growing, going in the right direction. Uh, then you have some that have very early, uh, you know, fallout that uh, you know crash and burn very early, and that's also okay because you can wake up and start another day. And then you have companies that ha are in neither category but are you know kind of uh, uh, I would line. say in the, in, in the yellow zone, right, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say, you know, uh, without any uh, 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 anything else implied that, you know, I would say for a fair amount of time, perhaps you felt in that mode until, you know, you hit the inflection point, right? Mm -hmm. And those are the toughest ones for the entrepreneurs because I'm sure many times people advise entrepreneurs that you should just shut it down and, and restart something new in life because it's not, not going to be a large company and sort of the living dead uh, mode. Right, but then you run into these uh, moments where something like what what happened to Gupshap, where you know you suddenly hit an inflection point, and now it's it's a huge company, right? So uh, that is the part that I think uh, I'd like your thoughts on. You know, for entrepreneurs uh, when they are in that state and that mode, what is the uh, reason to go one way or another in terms of their decision? Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, you know, it's not like you're just waiting there for something to happen, right? I guess that's not what I'm implying uh, by my earlier comments. I think usually if you're immersed in the space, you can see the early signs, right? You know what's coming and how it's coming. Uh, so there's a few indicators, right? 
One is, firstly, there's just a large industry size or there's a lot of revenue or money out there, right? In our case, businesses communicating with customers is globally a $50 billion industry, right? And $50 billion is just a way to measure that there's a lot of money being spent here. So this is, this is not going to go away. This is a problem that enterprises want a solution to. The only question is, you know, can it be, the, are there better ways and newer ways that allow you to do richer services, right? So, so firstly, that, that gives you faith that there is a, a big, you know, problem here. Um, and then the, uh, in terms of newer technologies, right? We, we experiment, we, we had launched something called, uh, called Team Chat, right? Or uh, when in, that was in 2014, which was literally the first messaging app with rich capabilities, right? But we were never able to get it to scale. But by 2016, Slack and Facebook Messenger launched mm -hmm. uh, bot APIs, right? And we were literally the first bot platform. We were the launch partners and so on. That's where we figured out all these advanced things saying, okay, here's how messaging should be. This is the future of messaging, except, you know, this is like the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed as they, as they say often in the Valley, right? So uh, because Facebook Messenger doesn't have that many users in India, for example, or, uh, you know, and, and uh, Slack was just an enterprise messaging app, right? So, so then the question is, okay, when is it coming to consumer messaging? Now we were also, you know, uh, I mean, WhatsApp had publicly said quite a few things. There were early signs that they're thinking about it. They were, they were going to do something. They had beta APIs and so on, right? And so, so you knew that, that I think it was 2017 or 18, something like that, right? And again, we were launch partners with, with those guys. So you see these sort of, and then we, as ourselves pioneered, you know, GIP, which is just unique, right? We reached out to uh, handset manufacturers and sort of did something. So these are, you know, between, I mean, you see these early signs that gives you the confidence saying, look, it's, it's happening. It's inevitable. Uh, it hasn't scaled yet. It hasn't, yeah. and, you know, I think if you look at payments, I mean, UID, right? It all started with that. And I mean, you read Nandan's book. I mean, there's going back so many years, he's talked about it. Now, as an entrepreneur, it's hard to actually time, you know, the the. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I was trying to do mobile payments pre UID, right? Pre Aadhaar, and that's when join Nandan on the Aadhaar program there. But uh, you're right; some things are inevitably going to happen. Question is, do you have the the conviction of that, and do you have the staying power? Uh, exactly right. Yeah, that. so sometimes it's hard, right? If you don't have enough cash flow from your in, something to support you while you're waiting for that. But then even as an entrepreneur sort of uh, wait for it, uh, you know, I think there's, there's other ways to, ways to do it, right? And sometimes it, may, it makes, makes sense to just say, look, you know, even if something new happens, it doesn't make sense to convert this into that. So you just sort of figure out a way to maybe sell it off or, you know, stop it and then move on to the next yeah. thing, right? Yeah. So um, talk a little bit about, you know, the team, right? And and then I guess your personal life, because we have this view of startups where everything is a frenzy and, you know, you have to do everything over the, you know, working 24-7 and, you know, it's it, everything is sort of high intensity, very fast moving. Uh, and then, of course, obviously, that's not sustainable over a, you know, 12-15 year period. So, uh, all of that has also got to be balanced, the work-life balance, you know, family uh, and things like that from the founder's side, from the team side building the team right to to be thinking long term rather than uh you know the the short term uh, sort of high intensity you know high action uh, uh thing and yet you also want to keep the innovation engine and that excitement going uh, with the team as well so what were some of the things that worked and what were some things you have done differently if you had to do it again yeah i think it is you know you're right i mean it's difficult to build and maintain energy and teams firstly just at a personal level right and then and then of course with the rest of the team and i think uh, these are moments where i think the, the leaders and the entrepreneurs have to lead because ultimately it reflects on uh, you know people are looking to you and it gets magnified and what you feel you know they feel or you know it leads to a lot of reactions right now so firstly for me I mean, I, like I said, right, and as I've already indicated, I was, I was optimistic. I had, you know, I had the faith and I was able to sort of uh, get the team to also keep the faith saying, yes, you know, it's difficult, they're challenging times. On the other hand, I mean, and by the way, this is how entrepreneurship works, right? The thing that helped me was, this is the second time, uh, you know, my, my second right. uh, 
cycle and Upwork, Elance Upwork was a great example to point to saying, you know, it was a, it was a 20 year journey from founding to IPO. And uh, sometimes, you know, people don't realize because in India you have this, there's this uh, competitive mindset. Oh, my friend has this title. So I have to have that title. My friend's company did an IPO. Uh, we should be doing it too. They got that bonus. I should be getting it too. And so on. Mm -hmm. And life, real life doesn't work that way. And I think you, you know, that mindset can be um, sort of very counterproductive. Uh, so one is just sort of keeping the faith. The other, right, even though from the outside, it looks like not much is happening internally, there's a ton of innovation that's going on. Uh, I mentioned that already, but we were constantly experimenting, iterating, building out new things, uh, you know, testing hypotheses. Could we do this? Would this work? Uh, maybe in a different country, in a different uh, ecosystem, on a different device, things like that. So, so there was there's still that frantic pace and energy of uh, innovation that you know, and that's what uh, people who are excited about things, working on challenging things, like to do, right? So, uh, so you can't stand still. You have to be pushing, innovating, and it's a little bit uh, like you know, you look, uh, you can only control the input, you can't control the output. Uh, I guess it's a, a modern paraphrasing of the Bhagavad Gita, perhaps, right? Like you focus, you know, trust the process, you sort of have to uh, keep right. at it and, uh, and, and so on. So it's, it's challenging. I think the only other thing I'll say is, you know, in terms of the team, it sort of, it filters out sort of the missionaries versus the mercenaries, right? If somebody is just looking for, um, you know, pay raises and sort of jumping ship and so on, I mean, anyway, those employees don't make the most sustainable partners and so on, right? But what startups really need, some tech businesses really need the missionaries, people who are committed, who are passionate, who are excited about the work they're doing. And they sort of keep the, uh, a little bit of a longer faith uh, because chasing salary jumps is, you know, I mean, as Valley and startup successes and so on have shown, I think a, a, a breakout uh, equity outcome you know, far offsets any sort of, you know, salary cash flow uh, thing that can that can happen. So I think just, uh, you know, uh, both the, so, so you build the right kind of team, the right kind of energy and so on. But conversely, you know, some people may leave, but the ones who remain are actually really, really committed for the long term. And that is really, you know, what makes a company succeed. Terrific. So um, maybe switching gears now, right? So 2021, you guys have raised a, a substantial round of capital from Tiger Global. Uh, and you know, while we are talking as if it's the destination, it's also still it's just a point in your journey, right? And uh, there's a long road ahead here as well. You know, uh, What keeps you excited about the next wave and the next five years of uh, this journey? Oh, absolutely. The headlines can be very, very misleading, right? They would, uh, I think the headlines would have you declare victory and run a victory lap and go home. And, uh, you know, again, I think it's, it's, it actually is doing a disservice to the entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? Uh, I think it's just an intermediate milestone. Uh, in fact, what people don't realize is the added burden and the stress and the pressure that comes in because one, you've raised expectations. Two, you've raised a valuation to a point that companies have to earn into, right? Just because an investor says we think it's worth that much, you know, uh, doesn't mean the public markets will automatically say that. Also, these are not mo monotonically growing functions, which means, you know, you can have down rounds, um, you know, and... Uh, and so on. So there's a there's a still, uh, you know, and you have the next hill to climb, and so on. So I think you really, I mean, that's the sobering reality of this, right? So you kind of, at least in our case, we had a, you know, a small celebration. Yes, it's an acknowledgement of all the effort and the, the long, you know, years of uh, blood, sweat and tears that went into getting to this point. So that's exciting, it validates it. But at the same time, I think if you get overly euphoric, Right. If you get complacent, if you feel for, even for a, the, a brief moment that, OK, you arrived, I think, you know, that's that's when trouble begins. So it's if anything, you know, you really need to double down and, you know, uh, focus even more on saying, OK, now with this added resources, where are we going to, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried, like, where am I going to spend the money? What am I going to do with it? You know, how am I going to achieve the next set of goals? And and usually what happens is when you have this sort of stuff, right, you, you, your organization is going to grow very quickly. Uh, how do you add so many people while retaining the culture, right, while making sure uh, 
Um, also, a lot of people coming in. I, I just talked about this missionary mercenary. I mean, you can't detect that in an interview, right? It takes sometimes, uh, you know, months and years to figure some of that out. Um, so you really want to get the right org, the right culture, you know, focus on the right things. Uh, you also have to be more tolerant of experimentation, some of which will fail, but, you know, but at least you can move fast. So as you have to change, move into a, a different gear and, and all of these changes, right? They're easy to say at an individual level, but it's hard to get like a few hundred people to also be in sync while you're making these changes, right? So, so I think it's, uh, you know, anybody, you know, I, I think the headline, if you just, as they say, right? Don't, don't believe your own PR, right? Don't, uh, of course, you know, we feel, you know, we're gonna, every company would say the right thing in the press releases, but, but there's an, uh, the, the objective reality on the ground is, uh, is, is different. So I think, uh, <laughs> uh, and I think yep. especially if the company is not profitable, it's even harder, right? Um, and some, either they're pre-revenue or they're, you know, early revenue, but some of the economics and the business model are not sorted out. I mean, it's, it's even more challenging to earn into the valuation that you received, uh, you know, because uh, it can be hard. So every, every company has a different set of challenges. Uh, and I think we are focused on ours, and that's enough to you know keep us grounded. Terrific, terrific. So, um, uh, Birud, you know, you're seeing a lot of what's happening in the opportunity in India now, uh, and uh, you know, we're seeing this massive explosion of digitization uh, for a variety of things, starting with Aadhaar, and then the whole India stack, and then the smartphone, and uh, you know, 4G. Uh, uh, penetration here in India and now with you know, demonetization and UPI and subsequently with COVID now, right? It's a lot of what you talked about is happening sort of uh, again at exponential growth rates uh, here in India as well. Uh, and so from an entrepreneur's perspective, um, you know, we talked about, you know, some of these things will take longer and so on, but there are some very attractive and juicy opportunities happening here. Uh, and you touched upon things like culture uh, recently, uh, just a, a few minutes ago. Uh, what would be your top three um, pieces of advice for entrepreneurs starting out now, uh, especially, uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in this space here in India, as, as lessons from the past, uh, from your journeys, both across freelance and uh, Gupshap, as well as if you were to do this again, what would you be? thinking to do differently. So what would some advice be? Oh, uh, I think there's, there's so many things to uh, to cover, but let me uh, like find a few. No, you're right. I think, um, uh, by the way, another lesson I want to be careful that people don't take the wrong lesson is, right? I think uh, obviously some are long journeys and you have to be patient, but sometimes there are these explosive phenomena, right? Uh, growth opportunities where if, if you dive in, the pace is going to be very different. And I think it's uh, maybe an analogy is, you know, an entrepreneur can't be just a sprinter or a marathoner, right? It's maybe more like a, like a decathlete, right? Sometimes you're sprinting, sometimes you're cruising, sometimes you're just jumping high uh, and, you know, different really, mm. the, 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 the only reality is your customer reality, right? And maybe, maybe the product uh, reality, which may be ahead of the customers, right? So, so you have to adapt, like say in our case, right? We've been very patient for a very long time, but now we're going to get into hyper growth mode and be in a very different gear, right? And I think uh, entrepreneurs need to be able to, as they say, scale and adapt to these changing situations, right? So coming to your question of if you're starting out now, I mean, in general, look, it's, it's impossible to time the market, right? by which I mean, if something is obviously a hot opportunity, well, there's 20 other entrepreneurs, maybe 50 other entrepreneurs doing the same thing. And then now suddenly you have a competitive problem. How do you differentiate? Mm -hmm. How are you better mm -hmm. than that? And so on. On the other hand, if you're looking sort of further out, you may have less competition, but now you have to have more patience, right? So uh, you trade off one set of problems for the other, right? So if you get into a hot space with a competitive problem, then you better have maybe more capital, more brand name recognition, more experience, and the ability to attract you know, rapidly attract um, employees and, and funding and, and get going very, very quickly uh, and partnerships as the case may be. On the other hand, if it's a longer game, then, you know, then you better have the patience and the perseverance and, uh, you know, and uh, the ability to keep the faith and, and find long-term investors and, and so on, right? So I think it really just, it's, uh, 
uh, you need different horses for courses, right? You need sort of uh, different sort of approaches. Uh, so, so in terms of lessons, really, is right. Uh, the, I mean, the uh, one thing is as you're as you're picking the space and the product idea and so on, right? I think uh, I think just focusing on you know just thinking about uh, the the assumptions. What's changing? Why is it changing? What are the implications of it? And and generally, if you pick a large enough space, I think it gives you enough room to maneuver. Uh, and to pivot and and tinker around because even if the initial thing doesn't work, you kind of iterate through and reach that thing, right? So just pick larger spaces. I mean, there might be one. Um, the the other is really just the the personal psychological aspect of it, right? I think you really need to be, uh, you know, balanced or even keeled uh, or 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 gritty. Maybe I think those are the the, the yeah. attributes. Mm-hmm. Because you you know all of these things that I'm talking about, I mean you're going to have euphoric and depressing moments, uh, and very extremes of emotions. And I think if you uh, can't deal with that, uh, you know, with the saying while well, while staying focused in the moment and staying focused on what you do control versus factors outside your control, I think this can, I mean, this can really the the process can really rip you apart, right? I mean, I think in, and and not just in the business part of it, but even at a personal level, I mean, it can really Sort of do do a number on it, right. so it's super uh, important as well. I think um, what else? Yeah, and just really, you know, don't get uh, the last thing might be is just uh, you know don't get carried away by. Uh, and I find this a lot with sort of younger um, employees and entrepreneurs and so on, right? I think there's a lot of external influences, and especially now with more money coming into the Indian market, uh, you know, I think it's going to even grow more. So if you just read the headlines and oh this guy you know uh, is worth so much and that guy is worth so much and and so on I think that's sort of the wrong thing to focus on it's really you know what you know what did they do why did it succeed how would it succeed and and more importantly going forward I mean, because this is a problem that Silicon Valley has lived with forever right if you're if you're worried about uh, doing this one up manship I mean you just go crazy because as everybody is walking around with a lottery ticket in their pocket. Right, and every day some lottery ticket pops, and it's not like you're any you're working any smarter or harder or less or more than you mm-hmm. were yesterday. Mm-hmm. But just because the other guy won a lottery ticket, are you going to feel bad about it? And and by the way, if if you do that, I think then you know then this is sort of the wrong space to be in because, like I said, everybody is walking around with lottery tickets with higher odds than real lottery tickets, right? So you really just have to say, okay, where am I? What am I doing? What is my objective reality? My product, my customers, my investors, my funding, my space, and good for that person. They got you know uh, everything. The stars aligned and things worked out for them. But uh, you know can't get distracted by it and can't measure my success or my progress based on somebody else's progress and success. Yeah, I think uh, you can't plan to win the lottery, right? But uh, it might happen. But yeah. Increase your odds as much as you can. I guess it's all no, you exactly. can focus I think, on. You know, hard work, creativity, you know, uh, innovation, uh, and you need a little bit of luck to succeed. But luck is highly correlated to hard work and creativity, right? So, so there's no guarantees, and there is it's an inher- inherently non-deterministic process. And and I think the problem is in a way like when you come through the Indian education system, right? Compared to let's say the American education in the Indian education system, everybody is uh, stack ranked, right? You get a rank, and you we all have this perception that oh, the higher you are, the better you are, the more successful you are, and everybody is on the same path, right? And the the problem is uh, the startup tech ecosystem and real world in general is is very different. You're not on a single path. There are a thousand paths or a million paths and different people may achieve different milestones on different paths. And the measures of successes are different, but we we still try to keep the single measure of success even when there are a hundred different paths and it just sort of, it, it breaks down, right? So that's where People say they want a higher salary because their classmates are getting a higher salary because they're operating. I mean, like, how does that even make sense? If you're working in a nonprofit, I mean, how would you compare salaries? Yeah, you may be having more impact, but yeah. you know, it's it's a different way to keep score. And I think people just have to get comfortable with it. I think you see a little less of that in the American system because they they respect individuality. You know, I mean, it, it has its own challenges, right? So I'm not saying it's better or worse. Nothing is perfect. 
but at least it recognizes differences and and you know uh, one person succeeding in their metric versus me succeeding in my metric are two different things and you just can't can't compare it so i think there's a, there's a lot of that you know that that especially at young entrepreneurs and students coming out of the indian system have to you know really appreciate very deeply nirud um i think um, these are some amazing insights and uh, once again uh, i want to close by saying congratulations on an amazing journey uh, and as you said uh, it's it's an intermediate milestone now the journey still continues so wishing you and the team at kapcha the very best in the years ahead and uh, look forward to continuing to see you support the indian startup ecosystem thanks for your time yeah absolutely sanjay thanks for having me here really enjoyed the discussion and i think yeah for all the entrepreneurs out there you know keep the faith it's it's not easy it's it, lots of challenges it can be difficult uh but you know you just need one successful outcome to make it all worthwhile right so and and that can that can happen remember you have a lottery ticket in your pocket with with fairly good odds yeah <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much peter del and i uh, appreciate you being on the show thanks a lot Listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app for free and you'll be the first one to know when new episodes are available. Just search for Prime Venture Partners podcast in Apple Podcast, Spotify, Castbox or however you get your podcasts. Then hit subscribe. And if you have enjoyed the show, we would be really grateful if you leave us a review on Apple Podcast. To read the full transcript, find the link in the show notes.